Looks like the live stream is up. Sergeant's going to start the recordings. PC recording done. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Youth Services. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video? Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to make, submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. Thank you. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today on this very important issue. Good morning. My name is Deborah Rose, and I'm the chair of New York City Council's Committee on Youth Services. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and recognize the members of the council who have joined us uh, of the committee, and I see Council Member Chin. Thank you for joining us this morning. Today, the Committee on Youth Services is conducting an oversight hearing on the youth count the youth count, which is administered annually by the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD. Every year, the city conducts a point in time count of homeless adults, youth and families in New York City based on the guidelines issued by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development or HUD. This count is comprised of three parts. The first part is the Homeless Outreach Population Estimate, or the HOPE count, which counts the number of unsheltered individuals. Unsheltered individuals are um, individuals who is narrowly defined as those individuals residing in a place not meant for human habitation. Number two is a census of individuals and families in transitional homes and emergency shelters. And number three, the subject of today's hearing, the youth count. The youth count supplements the hope count by capturing unsheltered youth, individuals 24 years and under, not included in the hope count. The resulting data is that is then used to determine how much funding will be allocated towards runaway and homeless youth services a social service sector that advocates have described as starved. The youth count plays a crucial role in determining what services are available to our city's extremely vulnerable, unsheltered homeless youth population. As such, it is imperative that its results are as accurate as possible. This is especially crucial in the midst of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic which has exacerbated poverty and homelessness in New York City, drained financial resources and created additional barriers to service. Despite the critical need for an accurate youth count, concerns of undercounting have been a recurring theme in previous hearings. Since 2015, when the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness mandated youth count, the citywide numbers of identified unsheltered homeless youth ranged from a low of 152 to in 2016 to the high of 265 in 2017. These estimates stand in stark contrast to the many hundreds of unsheltered homeless youth that providers encountered in the course of their work. While the resulting low numbers are partially due to HUD's narrow definition of the term unsheltered, advocates and providers have regularly raised credible concerns that the youth count is underfunded, understaffed, methodologically weak, and lacks critical youth participation. With each youth count and related hearings, it has, been become, it has become increasingly clear that the methodologies used need to be expanded to ensure that every effort is made to get an accurate count, which is crucial to runaway and homeless youth having access to needed resources and services. Number one, 
It is imperative both that DYCD and the next administration establish the youth count and runaway and homeless youth in general as their highest priorities. These services must be adequately funded because when we invest in our youth, we invest in our collective future. Number two, accordingly, DYCD should reevaluate the resources allocated towards youth count and ensure the, the, that the program is adequately staffed with individuals with homeless youth specific trauma informed training. Three. DYCD should work to strengthen its partnerships with the Department of Education. There is evidence that strong collaboration with educational systems is a common factor in successful youth counts across the nation. DYCD should incentivize the participation of youth as both youth count surveyors and respondents. Advocates and providers, and most crucially, Youth which with lived experiences of homelessness should have an increased role in all stages of the youth count, the planning, the decision making, and the implementation process. And lastly, since the youth count and the hope count are conducted in January on one of the coldest nights of the year, DYCD should work to gain greater access to youth count respondents particularly in indoor spaces, such as abandoned buildings, 24 hour retail establishments and hospital emergency rooms, none of which are being um, accessed now. At today's hearing, we shall consider to what extent these recommendations are reflected in the latest youth count results and preparations for the upcoming count. In addition, the committee will examine the youth counts methodology, planning process, resources, and ways to capture a more accurate estimate of unsheltered homeless youth in New York City. We will also explore how the youth count has adapted to the pandemic. And we will elicit feedback and experiences of the youth, the providers, advocates, and community members. In closing, we are here today to work cooperatively to ensure that our most vulnerable youth have adequate access to critical resources and services during not only one of the darkest moments in their lives, but also particularly challenging times in our city's history. I would like to thank the staff behind the scenes for making sure that our online hearing runs smoothly. I'd also like to thank the Youth Committee staff for their work on this issue. Committee Counsel Amy Briggs, Committee Policy Analyst Anastasia Zamina, and Financial Analyst Michelle Peregrine. And a big thank you to my staff as well, Legislative and Budget Director Issa Cortez and Budget um, and Legislative Aide Christian Rivello. And with that, um, I'd like to begin. Thank you, Chair. I, I'm Amy Briggs, Counsel to the Committee on Youth Services for the New York City Council. I'll be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called, you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. Council member questions will be limited to five minutes and council members, please note that this includes both your questions and the witnesses answers. Please also note that we will allow a second round of questions at today's hearing. These will be limited to two minutes, again, including both your question and the witnesses answers. For public testimony, I will call up individuals in panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raised hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the sergeant at arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Randy Scott, 
the DYCD Assistant Commissioner for Vulnerable and Special Needs Youth Division, and Tracy Thorne, the RHY Director. I will administer the oath to both of you. And after reading the oath, I will call upon each of you individually by name to respond to the oath one at a time. So if you will both please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Assistant Commissioner Randy Scott? I do. I will. <laughs> Thank you. And RHY Director Tracy Thorne? I will. Thank you. Uh, Assistant, Assistant Commissioner Scott, you may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair Rose and members of the Youth Services Committee. I am Randy A. Scott, Assistant Commissioner for Vulnerable and Special Needs Youth at the Department of Youth and Community Development. I am joined by Tracy Thorne, Director of Runaway and Homeless Youth Programs. On behalf of Commissioner Chong, thank you for this opportunity to discuss the city's youth count. The youth count is New York's New York City's point in time count of homeless and unstably housed youth and those accessing services at DYCD funded programs citywide. For almost 10 years, the youth count has supplemented the federally mandated HOPE count conducted by the New York City Department of Homeless Services and offered additional demographic and housing information to help inform policy for runaway and homeless youth. These efforts have been in partnership with the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness and Departments of Housing and Urban Development, Health and Human Services, and Education. An effective youth count utilizes the knowledge and expertise of those who understand where homeless young people are most likely to be and who are on the front line supporting the runaway and homeless youth. Our strong cadre of RHY providers and advocates. Their expertise has been critical in refining and improving the count every year. In the months leading up to the count, DYCD hosts a series of stakeholder planning and feedback meetings and training sessions. This year, despite our stakeholders focus on their immediate need to keep young people safe and healthy during the pandemic, we were able to plan and implement a, two, a 2021 count, which took place on January 27th through 29th. Since 2014, through the strong commitment of the de Blasio administration and the city council, we have strengthened the runaway and homeless youth system. We have more than tripled the number of residential beds, increased the age of service eligibility up to 24, and opened additional drop-in centers. There are currently eight DYCD funded centers with at least one 24 seven center operating in each of the five boroughs. In addition, young people have access to high quality mental health services across the portfolio. Finally, through the NYC Unity Project, we are able to expand services to address the unique and often unmet needs of LGBTQ youth. Over the past few years, with feedback from the youth count stakeholders, we have worked to refine our approach in determining how we should contact and where we should go to meet young people. In addition to phone calls and online surveys, we now cover areas that include drop-in centers, residential programs, community centers, transportation hubs, and public schools, and coordinate with street outreach representatives from the youth count, from representatives from the youth count to ask young people to complete a short survey. Our questions ask about current housing situation, age, gender identity, sexual orientation, and race. For the past several years, our youth count has taken place over the course of four days. This approach recognizes that young people who are homeless may not be out on the street on a cold winter night. By meeting youth where they are in the, in the following days, we can assess, assess their housing status on the night of the city's hope count to include those who are reported to HUD as part of the street homeless count and also those who may be staying with a friend or relative due to unstable housing. We have found youth in unsafe conditions, such as riding on the public transportation and abandoned buildings, local businesses, parks, and on the street. We also expanded our social media campaign and strengthened outreach in our drop-in centers. To maximize participation, we provide drop-in centers with additional funding to offer incentives for young people to complete the survey. We would like to offer some highlights of the 2020 youth count. Our planning began with a stakeholder meeting on October 17, 2019. 
We included all DYCD funded operators of residential programs, drop-in centers, and street outreach programs. City agency partners involved included ACS, DOP, DOE, the Youth Action Board, and Office of the Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services. Other non nonprofit and advocacy organizations included the Hatred Martin Institute, Fierce, the Coalition for Homeless Youth, and the Legal Aid Society. These efforts are supported by all members of the RHY staff who work year round to assist in the planning and execution of the count. In total, 34 organizations participate in the count and its planning. We were pleased to see that these efforts resulted in an increase in the total surveys at drop in centers by 441. Youth Action Board members surveyed 141 young people and were integral in increasing the total number of surveys. A promising practice emerged as one of the Youth Action Board members traveled in the street outreach van. The 2020 Youth Count reported responses from a total of 1,184 young people. The survey asked questions about where youth had spent the night on Monday, January 28, 2020. 631 youth, about 53% reported being in a stable housing, including their parents or relatives home or their own place. 498, 42% reported unstable housing as such as shelter or couch surfing. 47 reported being unsheltered and, represented off, offered, and representatives offered them shelter at the time of the survey and eight were from outside of the city. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, planning for 2021 youth count started in the spring of 2020. DYCD worked closely, closely with advocates, youth action board members, providers, and other stakeholders to update, survey questions, and discuss what worked and what additional steps should be taken to ensure an accurate count. These efforts were ongoing through January 2021 until the youth count began. Preliminary results from the 2021 New York City Youth Count are based on a total of 459 surveys. The surveys ask questions about where youth had spent the night on Tuesday, January 26, 2021. 20, Seven youth reported staying at a location that HUD defines as unsheltered, for example, spent the night in the street or in an abandoned building. 210 youth reported staying in unstable living conditions such as residential programs, shelter, drop-in centers, or with friends and relatives. 231 youth reported staying in a stable location with parents in their own room or apartment or being with friends and relatives for social reasons. And 11 young people were not in New York City on a night of the count. We have already begun our efforts for the 2022 count with a feedback session held on June 1st with our stakeholders. We look forward to your partnership with the council and other forward and others towards continuing improvement and to maximize connection with homeless and unstably housed youth in those efforts. Thank you once again for giving us the opportunity to discuss the youth count and we welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Um, Director Thorne, did you have, would you care to testify or should we go straight to chair questions? Uh, you could go straight to chair questions, thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair, well, I will now turn it to you for questions. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, thank you so much for your, your testimony, Deputy Commissioner. Um, and um, uh, I'm, I'm always glad to, to speak to you about um, youth services and, and how we can you know, maximize the, um, the resources that we have. And so um, my questions are, are basically going to be um, to, to determine what resources we have now um, and, and what we can do um, to, in, to increase them in the future. Um, what is the current level of staffing and funding that is dedicated to the youth count? And what is the specific budget that um, is, is um, dedicated to the youth count? I'm sorry. I, I, I repeated myself. What is the, the current staffing and the funding that's dedicated to the youth count? Okay, thank you for your question, um, Councilwoman Rose. So currently we have um, 
14 runaway and homeless youth staff dedicated to the youth count. Um, and we have numerous DYCD divisions that assist us in kind to make sure that the youth count is successful. Some of those divisions are, um, are staff from our ACO department, our fiscal department, our legal department, and definitely from our IT department who helps with the survey. As you know, um, the de Blasio administration virtually transformed the system of runaway and homeless youth. Um, since 2014, we have had more than tripled the number of residential beds, as mentioned, to, eight, to 813. We've increased the age of service eligibility, and we opened up additional drop-in centers. Um, there are currently eight, as I mentioned in my testimony, um, and with five of them being 24-7. Young people have access to high met quality mental health services um, within the borough and a total of all of the services and um, contracts that we have the budget for runaway and homeless youth is approximately 46 million um, dollars so via that those fund the funding we are able to um, put forth the youth count on a yearly basis and and what is the specific budget that's dedicated to the youth count at mm -hmm. present well, the specific budget varies year to year, depending on what has come out of the discussions that we've had with our partners, our stakeholders, um, as well as various incentives, micro purchases, food and metro cars that's identified in those stakeholder meetings that I mentioned. Um, so right now we, we look at from those meetings, we identify what the needs are for the youth count of that given year. So. The, the, there is no specific dollar amount right now, but however, via the 46 million that I mentioned, we identify what the needs are and then we use the funding um, to make sure that the youth count is successful. Are you, um, are, are you able to meet whatever that amount is? Um, since it varies, uh, it fluctuates from year to year, are you able to um, meet that, you know, that, financial need? Yes, we are. Um, you know, since the youth count has happened, we've been able to manage um, effectively to make sure that the micro purchases are given to the drop in centers in order for them to operate the way they are. We've been able to hire the youth count coordinators. We've been able to um, identify incentives that um, are given to those that participate in this with and in the youth count. So we have not had a year where we were not able to meet the needs. So um, are there any measures that you take to ensure that the count is adequately staffed and resourced? Well, again, um, as I mentioned, we have 14 staff dedicated to the youth count. Um, you know, so we've always made sure that we've had enough staff to make, guarantee that every area of the youth count is, um, is attended to and that it's successful um, when we've done it. As you may recall, the first youth count that we did, we only did it on one day. You know, started the second youth count going to current, we do it on four days. So we had to make sure that we had the adequate number of um, individuals to assist us knowing that we've increased the number of days that we do the youth count. And each year we've been successful in doing that. Okay, so um, you feel that this is adequate, that 14 um, dedicated staff members is adequate, or is there, do you feel there's a need for additional staffing and resources? Mm -hmm. one, one, of the, well, one of the things that the stakeholder meetings and all of the discussions that happen internally allow for us to do is to look at the trends, look at how things are evolving and changing, um, especially in our city, right? So based on those discussions is how we're able to assess if needs need to be um, improved or um, increased. Currently, based on the way the count is done now, we have adequate um, staffing for that. Okay, so your assessment is ongoing. It's yes, it's an ongoing because of the way the city is. Um, and I know that over time with changes to the city, we're gonna have to change how we do certain services. And those are the things that we look at um, on a regular basis when we meet about the services that are being delivered. Um, and, and what youth, homeless youth specific training do you provide to the youth count staff? 
And is there trauma-informed training included in that? Well, DYCD is, is very high on um, mental health in regards to um, its services. As you know, it's embedded in all of our runaway and homeless youth programs via um, an investment from the Office of Community um, and Mental Health. So we, we guarantee that our providers have the needed training as well as um, experience in working with not only the, the youth within their programs, but themselves. We also have, we've, well, we didn't have it last year due to the pandemic, but I'm sure you're aware we have our Healing the Hurt co um, conference, which allows for our providers to come in and learn from experts in the field around mental health, which is they can take home you know, various um, skills and training to use in their daily lives, as well as at their professional workplaces. So we, we guarantee that our um, providers have those resources with respect to um, mental health. And um, we recently just got a new investment where um, from the Office of Community Mental Health, where our drop-in centers will now become mental, well, well, mental health wellness hubs, where they will um, be able to hire um, LMSW or, um, LMSW staff members to work on those uh, mental health issues that are more serious. So we're definitely aware and we're putting in the um, efforts and the resources to make it available for our um, providers as well as the young people who are receiving services to get that, get those assistance. Um, is, uh, when is this training, you know, provided and is it mandated? Yeah, well, training, um, we basically have a calendar of when youth count is. Youth count usually starts in October, the planning, right? And from that first meeting in October, we have various stakeholder meetings. And then from those stakeholder meetings, training typically starts in January. Like the first and second week of January is when the training occurs about youth count. Um, if there's anything specific where folks identify a specific training need, then we make sure that that happens around that time. So you can say maybe between December and the second week of January is when the full training happens of all the um, stakeholders involved. And if we identify any volunteers from various divisions within our um, agency, they will receive that training at that time as well. What efforts have been made to meaningfully and consistently engage the youth who have lived experiences of homelessness in the planning, design, and implementation process of the youth count? Repeat that question one more time, please. Sure, sure. Uh, what efforts have been made to meaningfully and consistently engage youth who have lived experiences of homelessness in the planning, design, and implementation process of the youth count? Mm -hmm. Thank you for repeating it. Well, as, as I mentioned in my um, testimony, we have worked with, collaborated um, with the um, Youth Action Board and, you know, help, having them to help in terms of how we evolve the, the youth count. Um, the testimony spoke to the, the great efforts and work that they assisted in making sure that the, the youth count was done, the survey was done right, that we had the, the um, the adequate questions to ask of youth around um, housing and so on for um, the youth count. So we guarantee they're part of our stakeholder meetings, the Youth Action Board and various stakeholders who work with um, New York City youth on a daily basis. So we make sure that in those meetings there, they offer their best um, opinion and it's always reviewed and it's implemented in the the youth count. So that's an ongoing process. We had them in our recently um, meeting that we had in June. So we're, we're continuing that. And we are also working with, um, you know, the Coalition on Homeless Youth and other initiatives that they have um, going forward. So we're continuing to make sure that we have that youth representation and that advocacy representation um, when we're making uh, policy decisions. Okay, so they are at the table when the other stakeholders are at the table planning um, the youth count. Yes. Um, and how many how many of these young people um, are involved in that process? Well, it's open to all, but recently um, during the time of the youth count, I think that the Youth Action Board um, had two representatives at the meeting. Um, I believe they've added some more members to their um, to their board. 
So we welcome all of them to the to the table. We don't put a number on how many can participate. And um, and the the night, the days of the count, um, how many uh, of the YAB or the youth board members um, participated in the actual count? Um, I would have to get back to you on the specific numbers, but I know that um, the two members that attended the, the meetings on a consistent basis participated. So, but again, um, the youth count is open to all youth action board members or youth in the, in the city that have a stake with um, runaway and homeless youth. Are the runaway, um, the RHY providers contractually obligated to participate in the youth count? Um, and, you know, to what extent? And um, or are they opt, are they uh, given the option to opt out um, and limit their support and participation? Well, our current contractors um, providers understand the importance of the youth count. So within their work, so they are dedicated to guaranteeing that um, youth are surveyed and services are provided to youth in the city. Um, it's not currently embedded in their contracts um, with respect to them being required to do it, knowing that this is a federally, um, you know, initiative that is a federal initiative and not a city initiative, but it's something that is being discussed internally um, with respect to how that can, that can come to um, fruition. But for right now, you know, our contractor providers are seasoned professionals who have, um, you know, the, the utmost respect and importance of um, runway and homeless youth, and they want to do everything that they can possibly do to make sure that youth receive the services. So it's it's not, there's no pulling where we got to pull somebody's arm to get them to participate in the youth count. They are ready and they're willing and they're sitting at the table with us to make sure that this happens and it's done in the best way. How many of our providers actually participate? All providers participate. Um, you know, we have we have 15 contracted providers, but that makes up um, you know those 15 distinct providers. You know, make up the 50 residential programs that we have across New York City. The um, eight drop-in centers, as well as the two outreach contracts. So all of them are involved. Okay. Have any of the um, none have opted out or limited their participation? No. No. Okay. No. Um, what efforts have been made to ensure a timely publication of the annual youth count reports? Mm -hmm. Currently, neither the youth count 2019 results nor youth count 2020 results are posted on our DYCD website. That's their reason. I'm gonna correct why? you there. We are. It is. It is posted. Okay. So you should um, be able to go and see it. Um, okay. Is that recently that it was posted? Yeah, it was recently <laughs> about last week. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Yes, um, yes, yes. <laughs> in anticipation of this question this week. <laughs> uh, okay. Hey, you know, we got to be one step ahead, right? <laughs> um, okay. So, um, so uh, is are, are we making putting you know some measures in place to um to make sure that they are are posted you know in a more timely manner yes um, yes we are mm -hmm. yeah. yeah okay i think with the with the pandemic and us being remote and all the different things that we we've been working on the new investments that the that runaway and homeless youth um have been working on because as you know we have the emergency housing vouchers and the city for hep vouchers and we now have the mental health wellness hubs things sometimes um get overlooked and that was one of the things so we apologize for the delay and we'll definitely make sure that um it's posted in time all right um because it, it is important and, yes. and it it also um gives us uh something to work with you know since we have oversight Yes, correct. One thing I do want to um, just make you aware of is that that report, our report is attached to the bigger um, hope count report. So in regards to that report being um, posted, we st still have to wait for DHS um, to post their report 
um, so that all of it can be understood and not just a portion of it is put on the, um, the site. So that also causes some of the delay in terms of waiting for our sister agency to post their numbers so that we can make sure the report is um, active. So, but we will work with, um, you know, our counterparts at DHS, um, as well as folks internally to make sure that it's posted in a timely manner. Yeah, because they have to post it annually and, and usually there's a, a particular time yeah. that they, they have to post it. So Exactly, you and know. we have to wait around that same similar time. So, but, but I definitely understand what you're saying and uh, we will work on it. Okay, okay. Um, what efforts have been, you know, I, I know that um, uh, some of our, our participating partners in this effort is, uh, is DOE. So um, what efforts have been made to strengthen, you know, our DYCD partnership with the Department of Education to increase the youth count effectiveness and accuracy? Um, I, I think that they would be, you know, um, a great source of uh, a great resource um, and have access to numbers of young people that, you know, greater, greater number of, of young people. So um, what are we doing to strengthen that relationship? Um, definitely is a, a ongoing relationship where we talk more now than ever with um, our counterparts over at DOE, especially in the um, Students in Temporary Housing Division. Um, we worked with them recently to create a housing um, navigator um, system where youth and uh, young adults can go to the website and identify um, needs around housing and other services. And it was a collaboration between um, DYCD, HRA, ACS, DOE, and, um, and others. So that is currently active, which um, DOE um, maintains that system. So that was one way that we made sure that information was out there and relevant to, to um, all that needed the service. Another thing that we did is during the pandemic, we worked with them to guarantee that youth had the necessary tablets um, you know, for them to continue their, their education and um, their needs that were important. So we got those um, devices to individuals within our um, contracted programs. They're also participants in a youth count where they, we work with them to identify how the survey can be delivered. Um, it's, it's an ongoing process because it deals with a lot of IRB um, stuff. And, you know, we got to make sure that we have the necessary individuals who can deliver the survey. So we're having ongoing discussions with them of how we can, we can do that. And that's one of the things that we're talking about currently for the um, upcoming youth count. And we hope that we can be able to um, manage that. But there is always continuous conversations that are being had with DOE um, on youth count as well as other relevant um, needs of runaway and homeless youth. So um, we're, we're in a good place, you know, where we can have those um, contacts. We know who we can call and we can have those discussions. Um, yeah, that that's my concern. Are there actually, uh, is there actual individuals or dedicated staff that, um, you know, who are responsible for working with you um, on the youth count? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I have experience with SYEP. Yeah. We send the applications to the guidance counselor and some of them are very good and it gets distributed and it works well. And then there are other schools where you would think there was um, no young people interested in SYEP. Yeah. So um, uh, how coordinated is it, it you know? Um, it's, 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 it's on our end as well coordinated because we um, keep in contact with them. For DOE, we work with Michael Hickey who oversees the um, Students in Temporary Housing Division. We also, for um, District 79, we work with Stacey Olager from um, DOE. So we have primary contacts who we can pick up the phone, shoot an email to, to ask a question or to um, invite them to a meeting or to get their opinion on how things can work um, more collaboratively um, between the two agencies. So I think we're, we're in a good place. 
um, we will have to keep having those conversations in, in case things change with, with the new administration and people go out and new people come in to make sure that nothing um, falls in regards to the systems that are currently in place and how we can improve those systems. So we're, we're, this is right now is probably a, a heightened time for us based on the fact that we're moving into a new administration where we want to make sure that we keep contact with individuals so that they understand where we are and what we want to try to do in the new administration. So those are things that we um, continuously do here. Um, Commissioner Chong was great in terms of, you know, integration, you know, breaking down silos and working together. And we're trying to make sure we do it greatly in internal and we're going to make sure that we can do the same thing externally. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep those channels open. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and with your relationship with DOE, it is only certain um, schools that you you work with, or is it all of the schools that you work with? I want to say all the schools, but I, I, I will ask Tracy to come off mute and um, share her, her knowledge of which schools that we work with. I think it's the community schools that we work with, but can, can you confirm that, Tracy? Can, I think she needs to come yeah, off mute. Hi, Tracy, you, you're muted. She can't unmute herself, she said. Oh. Oh, there she goes. Hey, hello. Um, hi. Yes, I just, I'm confirming. Well, first, I just want to say that this is, I'm glad that you are bringing attention to this really important issue. So I just want to thank you for that. Um, but Randy's right, yes. Uh, the community schools are the ones that we're focusing on right now. Okay. Um, are you, do you see a need to expand that to the schools that are not community schools? Yeah, definitely there's a need to strengthen our partnership with the Department of Education. It's, it's really important and, and a really high priority. Um, but as I said, it's, you know, we're starting with the community schools and we're hoping to take that success and kind of move out into the um, high schools beyond the community schools. But for now, for this for this come upcoming count, we will be focusing on the community schools. Um, okay, uh, so, um, so then in the planning of not this year's, but the next cycle, um, are you now planning to, to expand that? Yeah, um, well, yes, we'll do, yes. Because not, not all communities um, have community schools. Uh, I, I know the mayor's working hard to expand that, but um, it, I think it's really important that we we touch um, all of our schools. Um, I completely agree. The yes. homeless youth population is, is very broad. Yep. Uh, yeah. yeah. We're, we're trying to, um, you know, knowing that the school system is so, so big, we're trying to take it piece by piece um, so that we can almost like deputize people after we've gotten into their system so that they can speak on our behalf so that we can now become even more bigger within the system. So that, that's that been our approach where we start with the community schools and then from the community schools, have them also help us get to the other areas that we need to go to. I was really pleased to hear that, you know, you're utilizing, you know, technology, um, but uh, can, you know, based on the information that you learned in the past year, um, do you think that you're going, that, that the use of technology increased the accuracy of your count? And um, are you making provisions to actually expand um, the use of technology or how many people have access to the technology to, to yeah. do the count? Well, one thing that the pandemic um, taught us was that technology is important, right? Um, so we definitely want to learn and grow from what we were able to um, put forth during the pandemic. We, we're, we're not going to go back to pre-pandemic um, youth count. <laughs> we're going to use what we did during last year's um, count, bring it into um, the overall picture and see how we can improve it and go forward with um, having a bigger and better um, count that can include technology, can include foot traffic once we're we're back into the communities, um, can, can include, include all type of situations where we can um, make sure that everyone is aware of the youth count, they participate in the youth count, and they receive services um, that they um, identify 
um, for themselves going forward. So yes, we will be improving that. Um, and my last question, because I know my my colleagues have some questions, and then I'll I'll circle back. But um, what efforts have been made to strengthen DYCD's partnership with the New York City Department of Ed? to you know increase the efficacy and uh, accuracy i think we've kind of talked about that but does dycd plan to have an mou to use doe staff since you know they already have dedicated staff to engage this population that is part of the that will be part of the discussions that we will have um if we can do it without an mou i'd probably like to go that route you know you, if it's easier to be done, but if an MOU is required to um, have the relationship where they are more active in the youth count, then we will go that route with them. Um, but if we can do it without an MOU where we is dedicated um, collaboration, then that's fine. But we will identify, um, discuss and identify all avenues in order to improve um, services for youth um, count as well yeah. as other RHY services. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that an MOU um, sort of codifies the, the relationship and, and ensures that there really is are really are dedicated individuals to, to do this? Um, yes, it does. Um, because right now it, it's kind of like up to the principal's discretion, right? Yeah, yeah. it's up to the principal's disc um, discretion. The MOU, however, will probably not only be for um, dedicated staff time, it also will include data and things of that nature where you would have to have a more, um, you know, fleshed out discussion of how that can be. It's not easy with the confidentiality um, requirements from the state on information. You got to make sure that it's something that all stakeholders are at the table and discuss, understand, so that when the MOU, if an MOU is decided upon, is um, fully understood by each party um, with respect to what will be needed for the youth count. And I wouldn't, you know, if you're gonna do an MOU, may, you might not wanna only do it for youth count, you might wanna do it for other areas as well, you know, for because runaway homeless um, is not just youth count, it's a whole bunch of other areas that you need to focus on. And mm -hmm. DOE can be very um, helpful and fruitful for those other right. areas. So you wanna make sure that when we right. think about an MOU, we are, um, we're thinking about all those possibilities so that we only do one MOU versus having 20 MOUs. So that's what I was saying in regards to the MOU. Just wanna make sure that we flesh out what the need is, identify who the individuals need to be at the table to discuss what the needs are, and then put together that um, MOU with the legal divisions of both city agencies. Yeah, I, I think it helps in terms of the access, the accuracy, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and the data collection. Correct. Um, Correct. So uh, um, I'll, I'll be looking forward to hear how that kind of, you know, evolves. Um, uh, I'd like to now. Um, I, hope, I hope you will continue to be a vital part of our, our services after January. <laughs> I hope so too. I hope so. I hope so too. You know, <laughs> if, I, if I have your email, I'll probably be emailing you. <laughs> I'm applying for the commission of youth job. Okay, come on. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'll now open the um floor um or give the floor back to to my council to open the floor for questions from my, my colleagues. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to begin just by recognizing Council Members Phillies, Louis, Lewis, and Riley for joining us today. And I will begin with, I believe Council Member Chin had her hand raised. So Council Member, if you still have any questions, please begin, feel free to begin. Yes, Starting thank time. You. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First is, uh, yeah, Assistant Commissioner, in your testimony, um, in terms of the survey, in 2020, you had 1,184, and then 2021, from the preliminary result, was only 459. So I wanted to know, like, what, what was such a, a big uh, drop-off? Secondly, um, are there any efforts to really increase public awareness 
about the importance of the youth count? Like, are there any public awareness campaigns so people know, you know, how they can refer people, refer young people that they know uh, that might be homeless uh, to do the survey? And then my other question is, um, is the, the importance of immigrant youth. Um, and some of it is with DOT, uh, DOE, uh, in terms of some of the school that serve um, immigrant population, especially uh, the older population. Uh, I know that they have a list of schools and I have some of them in my district. And I have heard from counselor uh, that there are youth you know, who are in a homeless situation. So I wanna make sure they're included uh, in the youth count and also our faith-based organization and also you know, food pantries and, and other youth programs that DYCD has contracted with like the Cornerstone program. Because even though we have you know, like drop-in center in every borough, the drop-in center might not be an easy place for youth to access. You gotta you know, pay for transportation or it's too far away, but they oftentimes they might go to a Cornerstone program um, in the neighborhood. Uh, or drop by a food pantry or a church. Uh, so those are some of my questions in terms of how, how are you working with, with these populations? Great. Thank you, Councilwoman Chen, um, for your questions. Um, in regards to the numbers, the 1,184 was during, done during, before the pandemic, and the 459 was during the pandemic year where we didn't have as much access to the city because of the, the fact that people were businesses were closed um people were working remote and the city was you know going through this this terrible um pandemic so that's the reason why there's a dip in the numbers and we um weren't we had to hud didn't allow for us to do certain um certain efforts to get at people due to the fact that they they have a certain way of how they want to um results to, to happen. So we were only able to get the 459 surveys based on what we were able to do from tabling from the um, from the workshops where the staff had to be in front of the youth when they distributed the um, survey. So youth couldn't take the survey without an individual actually being there with them. So that caused the drop. We're hoping now that the city is um, moving back to opening up fully. We can have a, a better um, 2022 count and the numbers will go back up. Um, and so we'll see how that goes. Um, to the second question, okay, because I know you gave me three questions. I could uh, let me answer the immigrant question um, first. We definitely um, provide services to, to immigrants um, and we try to communicate as best as possible. We work with Moya to come in and um, provide the necessary training and um, information to our providers so that they can use that in their respective communities to make sure that they um, make services aware to, of what's going on. For the way we social, um, socialize this information, we have many different avenues um, that we do this. Um, we have our, the link NYC where we promote the youth count and make sure information is there. We have our um, downloadable palm card that we distribute to the masses to make sure that folks are aware of what's happening. Um, we have the young people who are experts in sharing the information and they did that for us with respect to youth count. Street Outreach does their different efforts to make sure that this is known. Um, the providers themselves use their social media accounts to share information. Um, and DYCD has a huge social media campaign that I'm sure you're aware of with Discover DYCD. And we work with NYPD, um, where they have discovered um, DYCD on their phones. So we have now branched out to many different places so that we can get our information out to the communities um, on the different efforts that are happening. One thing that we're also doing internally is we're working to identify more ways we can advertise and promote the services of Runaway and Homeless Shoot. So I'm working with my, um, my colleagues. I'm expired. I'm working with my colleagues internally to make sure that that happens. So um, this is an ongoing um, effort. You know, we're going to improve on what we already have existing so that we can make sure information gets to all communities that you have discussed, especially um, um, immigrant communities. I hope I answered all your questions. 
no, when I would, yeah, definitely. I mean, the immigrant community should also include with your DOE conversation. Oh, yeah. Is that there are schools that have, you know, immigrant youth and especially the older age yeah. one. And they have special school that, that serve as that population. Like in my, in my district is Emerald Lazard High School. Okay. And uh, so, I mean, DOE has to listen. And these are the, the school that we, we should pay some special attention to. Okay. We, we will definitely put that on the, um, the, the topics to discuss with um, DOE so that we can make sure that um, they're included and, and not excluded. Thanks Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Great. Do we have any other council members of council that would like to ask questions? It does not appear that we have any other raised hands. So we can now begin our second round of questioning, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I really want to emphasize uh, Council Member Chin's point about access to our immigrant um, populations. Um, and so I know that uh, in our public awareness campaigns that we are uh, disseminating information in, in all of our languages, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, and I look forward to you having that conversation with, with DOE. DOE. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, you did mention um, COVID, you know, and the pandemic. Um, can you tell me what you did do to um, adapt to the environment, you know, to the youth count um, during the COVID-19 outbreak? Sure. Um, for one second, let me just get to my specific notes. Um, something. Let me pass that to Tracy. You want to share the the steps that we took to monitor or plan for youth count during the um, pandemic? Sure, yes. Hello. Um, so during, co during COVID, we weren't able to have large gatherings. Social distancing was really important. And so the usual way that we um, do the youth count in congregate settings, bring the young people into the drop-in center, give out um, the incentives, we had to rethink that due to the need to social distance. And so we came up with um, a virtual tabling sessions on Zoom, with Zoom for um, about six hours a day, every day. And we widely distributed the Zoom links to via social media. Um, we had a, um, some young people participate in the tabling. So they were surveying um, young people. We also had feedback from my brothers and sisters keepers, um, part of a youth council here at DYCD. So they were able to participate in the survey and then give feedback to us afterwards as part of a, a, a learning session um, on, the, on the virtual tabling. Um, I think as a concept, um, it was, it was good. We didn't have as much traffic as we would have liked, but we definitely had tons of volunteers from the um, Youth Count community. We had volunteers from um, all of our stakeholder groups, federal government, um, nonprofits, and um, like I said, young people. So it was, it, was a, it was a pivot. We did it. And you know, if, if possible, we may do it again this year as well. Um, to see if that's another way of increasing the number of people who have access to the youth, youth count. Where were these tabling events um, like held? How did you, how did you actually do, do that? Yeah, they were posted, there were links posted online on our website. Mm -hmm. um, and we use social media to attract young people to the Zoom links. Mm -hmm. And then it was um, myself and several other volunteers. Who, we would go into breakout rooms and survey young people. We needed to do it um, with, the, with the cameras on um, and face-to-face. -face. So it was one-on-one -on -one virtual link face-to-face -face, uh, interviews for the surveys. You were able to maintain confidentiality Yes, it was one one surveyor and one youth in the break in each breakout room. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And um, how many um, surveys do you think you were able to complete by that method? We were able to we were able to count 19 surveys. So um, we also had a chance to talk to young people in the in the um, in the waiting room about services about you know considerations for the future so it was it was definitely a very um, excellent learning opportunity for all of us mm -hmm. um, and the information um, was sent to the schools who were doing remote um, learning anyway right um, about the, tabling events we we the the schools participated in all of the planning and all of the feedback sessions but we weren't we did not do um surveying with the schools um we so yeah we didn't do surveying with the schools uh this year in that way you know um i wanted to ask about you know incentives you know how are we incentivizing more young people to you know participate in the surveys but also to respond to them um uh are we what what incent how are we incentivizing them do you um so for young people we are um this year we're planning to offer um incentives through um uh, micro purchases through our providers um at the drop-ins so that when young people come, they can receive um, items, they can receive clothing items, hats, Metro cards, food cards. They also get, um, the providers also get a lot of um, um, donated cards um, to, to give out to the young people as well, like food cards um, um, to specific restaurants um and so we we're able to get people to come in last year we weren't offering incentives as much because we couldn't have loud crowds congregating so we're really hoping this year like um assistant commissioner scott said that we'll be able to proceed in a more um in a more um i, I want i don't want to use the word normal but okay. in a more you know congregated setting our, our you know, way normal. to go <laughs> yeah yeah our new normal exactly whatever that is um so you know we want to we want to definitely have incentives again we definitely want to be able to um help young people so the incentives aren't sort of uniform uh, uh, across the city it's it's sort of whatever the um the providers the stakeholders um can sort of amass to to um to you to use to incentivize the um young people yes usually um, usually it's it's similar types of similar types of um incentives definitely metro cards like i said definitely like um food cards for different restaurants maybe cash cards um and um metro cards i think i said that already and clothing uh -huh. items so and things that young people may need um hand sanitizer gift mm -hmm. like bags like gift bags like that so um dycd doesn't provide um these incentives um and we provide the funding for the incentives it's provide the funding it, it's actually okay. a quicker route to the end than going through procurement in the city mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. um and so uh do you do you have an idea of sort of how much money you dedicate for um incentives um though that is being discussed right now and um is that one of the the budget items that kind of vary um that uh commissioner scott spoke about earlier exactly yeah um and are we giving adequate amount of money uh to the providers so that they can um incentivize young people to participate um can um assistant commissioner scott would like to be unmuted uh 
Okay, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> you know, you gotta gotta get used to Pass it. being too. placed on mute. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in regards to the the funding, you know, the providers have the discretion to use their their the funding within their budget. You know, identifying how they will disperse each um, budget item line for youth count, so they can add additional dollars to that. Um, what we try to do is supplement it um, with the cards and things that um, are donated so that they can use that for um, youth that participate in the survey. And we actually just got some cards for um, for the providers now. So the thing is, is we, we let them identify what they will do, whether they go out food, whether they'll give out um, gift cards, however that may be. And then the drop-ins get the additional um, micro purchases um, on top of that. So that's how we're doing so, it. So, but that's that's um, that's based on um, their their discretion and um, and their budget. So, say my budget is is kind of tight. Maybe I won't offer um, incentives for the count. It, I mean. It, it could well, work that way, right? Well, if 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 a if it comes to that, that's where one we give the um, micro purchase, and two we identify additional ways of incentive incentivizing, um, you know, getting incentives for the the providers. So we look at all of the, the avenues um, because we know that the budgets could be tight, and ways that we can get things to the youth, whether it's like. Tracy said, through the, the clothing that we may give, whether a t-shirt, a hat, um, knowing that it's that type of, um, the weather is cold during that time, whether it's um, gift cards from food places or um, other types of things. So we look at all avenues of how we can just continue to supplement on top of what um, is able to be done. But so far, all providers have been able to um, is there it. any any thought or consideration to um, sort of a dedicated um, budget line for for incentives? In term, well, we do we have a, de a dedicated budget line in terms of the micro purchases. We have that consistently. Are you saying at the for, for each of for each of the you know each of the facilities, each of the um, stakeholders, yeah. like um, yeah. just sort of a line item um, amount for for the count and and that goes back to um my earlier point where through discussion through looking at trends through looking at what is happening currently in um the city is how things evolve in terms of what is needed so those are things that we look at to see how we can um improve from the year before so and because when we first started we didn't have anything that were, was given out except for food but now we've increased it to where we have micro purchases. Now we've increased it to where we have um, donations of gift cards. So we, we are continuing to look at how we can, um, um, you know, get more youth in, incentivize them to come in. And um, so we'll see how that grows um, over time. All right. And that's yes. part of the discussion that you're having yes. um, in the planning of the 2022 count. Yes. Yep. Yes. In 2022 okay. and going, mm -hmm. going forward. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you are beginning the planning for 2022 in October. The planning, um, for the started, we had a, we had a stakeholders meeting on June 1st. Okay. Um, so the next meetings will yes occur in October. Right now we're working on, um, bringing onboarding the staff, the two youth count coordinators. Okay. And, and, and you're including additional young people in that? Well, the young people we hope will be through our collaboration and work with the Youth Action Board and um, the Coalition for Homeless Youth and other stakeholders that identify youth because it's open to them, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanna uh, um, ask this last question of you. Um, how much um, input do um, the stakeholders really have? Um, you know, they, they've been concerned, they've been, you know, sort of bringing up certain issues uh, for several, several years now that I've been the chair. Um, and, uh, 
and you know we've we've asked you about these issues. Um, how much, really, how much influence do the stakeholders have, and how close are we moving to um, to getting to addressing their issues? I think they have a lot of influence, and I think over the years they can say, and I hope they will say that you know the relationship between them and us has improved tremendously you know through partnerships through communications through being on different um work groups together where we are able to um speak openly and candidly about what is needed and make sure and sure that it happens one a great um example of that is a direct cash transfer right we were a part of that um conversation with youth action board with government and now we have that actively um, coming to New York City, right? With a, a with a, um, one of the RHY providers being identified as the, the engine to move that, right? So the thing is, is that we have these conversations. We, we speak regularly through emails. Um, we invite them to our work groups. We, um, we allow for them to see things um, that are happening policy-wise or, um, so that they can offer their um, insight and opinion and we can move things forward. So I think, and I would love, to I, I, be honest with you, I think the relationship is good. I think there's always room for improvement, which and those are the things that we're looking at doing now. But um, to be honest with you, I think um, we've done some, we've made some great strides with respect to their opinion being um, appreciated at the table. I just, I know one of their, their, um recurring, you know, um, concerns is uh, the trauma-informed training. Is there some way that we can look at sort of formalizing that so that that happens um, not sort of matter-of-factly, but that it, it, it happens uh, regularly? It's almost like um, an ongoing class or something that can be offered. Are you saying this for the providers to receive this? Oh, training? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. For the we, providers we, and anyone who is giving, anyone who's participating in the youth count, because mm -hmm. that um, they feel that, you know, um, there should be some specialized training because of, you know, our vul the vulnerability of the population we're working with. I, 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 would definitely love to, to hear more about that, but I could tell you what's happening okay. now. What's happening now with um, agency wide is that we have our capacity building who um, look to identify many different trainings for not only staff, but provider agencies to participate in. We have a technical advisor, um, Vibrant. Um, I'm hoping, sure you may have heard of them or know them, who does a lot of our mental health um, trainings and you know, they work with us on the Healing the Hurt conference that we um, had yearly prior to the pandemic and which we hope to um, bring back now that we're getting back to some normalcy. Um, we have our TIPS program, which is our trauma-informed perspective practice series where we um, train provider agencies and um, staff on how to manage trauma, how to deal with it, how to recognize it. So we have yeah. these things in place. So I, I really would like to hear more in terms yeah. of what is, a, is mm -hmm. being um, asked of. Yeah, they were specifically talking about um, the people who participate in the count should um, be trained. Okay. Trauma okay. Form, you know. Okay, so I would I would love to hear us okay. at, the, at the stakeholder meetings. We can um, definitely talk more about that and see um, okay. what can be done. Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and um, I'd like to get invited to one of those planning meetings. I thought okay. you were already um, invited because I, I believe I, some of your staff have attended. Because Michelle in the comes, right? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Michelle because some of your staff have come in. The yeah, I'll, I'm going to have to tell her to let me know when the meeting is. So okay, that I, great, I, great. I, I, <laughs> all right. Um, well, I'm, I, I'm th thank you for, um, for your responses and your time, um, but I have no other questions, um, Council. Thank you, Chair. Um, it looks like we don't have any raised hands from other council members. So at this time, we have concluded the second round of questions. Um, I'll now turn to the Chair if you have any closing remarks before the administration is excused. Um, I just, again, I just want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for coming. Um, I, 
I know you know how important the youth count is um, in terms of making sure that we can provide the services and the resources that, um, you know, a very vulnerable and traumatized, you know, pot, uh, segment of our population. Um, I, you know, I appreciate your efforts on behalf of the youth count. Um, I, I just want to make sure that we're bringing everyone to the table uh, so that their input can be, you know, recorded and valued and utilized um, in the in terms of getting an effective and accurate youth count. So um, again, thank you. I know we're all working under difficult circumstances during the pan, you know, through this pandemic. Um, and uh, I, I just hope that we can um, get our, our message out, you know, uh, farther and wider. Um, but other than that, I, uh, I, I thank you for coming. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chair. I will now be turning to the public testimony portion of this hearing. For public testimony, I will call up individuals in panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of the staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after, the setting, after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The next panelists will be in the following order. Jamie Polovich, the Executive Director of Coalition for Homeless Youth, Anthony George from Project Hospitality, Beth Hoffmeister from the Legal Aid Society, and Jane Biggleson of Covenant House. Um, Jamie Polovich, you may begin your testimony. Starting time. Good morning, my name is Jamie Polovich and I'm the executive director of the Coalition for Homeless Youth. Thank you to Chair Rose for holding today's hearing and for the council's ongoing support of youth experiencing homelessness in New York City. I will be submitting longer testimony outlining the history of the youth count and our full recommendations, but I'll keep my verbal um, testimony focused on a few specific points. During the testimony of the administration, there are many things stated that we would categorize as not true or extremely misleading, which we find extremely concerning. However, their testimony does continue to highlight how there is an unfortunate disconnect between what is happening on the ground and what DYCD wants to portray as happening regarding services for youth experiencing homelessness in this city. Before I talk about our our ongoing recommendations, I would like to highlight some of the more concerning statements that were made. It was said that at least two of the YAB members participated in the actual count. This is untrue. And as the YAB testified at the youth count hearing in April, they issued a letter to DYCD in January stating that they would not participate until aspects of the count were improved. This letter was not addressed and therefore they did not participate. It was also said that there are 14 staff at DYCD dedicated to the count and that there's a budget of approximately $48 million. This again is extremely misleading. The entire DYCD runaway and homeless youth unit is not dedicated to the youth count, nor have they ever been. This past count, the 2021 count, was run by one individual, Miss Tracy Thorne, who tried her hardest given the impossible task she was given, but the count is too large to be the responsible responsibility of a single individual. Similarly, the entire runaway and homeless youth budget is not accessible to the count. This past year, there was a budget of zero, which is a fact that DYCD stated on public documents about the count. Neither programs nor youth received any financial support. There are other issues that due to time, I will add to my written testimony. Regarding our recommendations, I would like to highlight our top four. Again, the, the rest will be in our written testimony. As we testified in April, it is imperative that we have an accurate estimate of homeless youth in New York City, given the power such numbers play and the resources provided for those extremely vulnerable and often invisible population. 
Systematic undercounts of street homeless youth only support systematic under-resourcing to providers and a lack of needed services to youth. Therefore, we are concerned that the community planning for the 2022 count has still not officially begun, and that despite providers, youth, and advocates echoing the same recommendations year after year, they remain largely unaddressed. Our top recommendations are as follows. Number one, the city must provide adequate funding for the youth count. Time expired. Oh. Can I briefly say the other three? <laughs> uh, you, um, finish your statement. Just finish um, your sentence. Okay, the city must provide adequate funding for the youth count. Um, the last funded youth count was conducted in New York City, it was funded by city council in 2017. It was championed by the late councilman Lou Fiddler. Oh, thank you for your testimony, Ms. Jamie. Um, can I, I will now call on Anthony George to testify. Starting time. Anthony available. It looks like Anthony ha is no longer available. So I'll now call on Beth Hoffmeister to, to testify. Starting time. Um, unfortunately, we have lost Beth as well. But we still, ha still have Jane Biggleson. I will now call on Jane to testify. Starting time. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jane Biggleson, and I'm the Vice President of Advocacy at Covenant House New York, where we serve young adults experiencing homelessness between the ages of 16 to 24. I'd like to thank you, Chair Rose, the entire committee, and the committee staff for the opportunity to testify today. I refer you to my written testimony for more about Covenant House. As we all know, young adults experiencing homelessness are often invisible among us and locating and counting them is extremely difficult because being hidden is often a survival strategy. A majority of young people experiencing homelessness have histories of repeated trauma and abuse and feeling disrespected by the adults and systems that were supposed to care for them. Therefore, they often avoid service providers and do everything in their power to not look homeless and to blend into their peers to avoid further stigmatization. On particularly cold nights, youth avoid the streets and instead find shelter in abandoned buildings, fast food restaurants, and with strangers who offer them shelter in exchange for sex. These young people are almost always missed in the city's annual youth count, which is often during the coldest days of the year. That results in a significant undercount that is far out of alignment from reality. We know that DYCD is experimenting with different methodologies and we appreciate that and we appreciate the city council's oversight and help in, in getting more accurate numbers, but we do have some recommendations. The first is for the youth count to succeed, it must be adequately funded. Yes, DYCD mentioned that they had 14 staff people working on the youth count, but we need at least one or two where the youth count is one of their main responsibilities because with repeated or, or differing responsibilities, attentions often get distracted away from the youth count. And although I do believe DYCD seems eager to implement many of the provider's recommendations, limits in staffing and resources often delay and redirect effort. So it's often too late to implement the ideas that we have. Also important as we all know is that youth with lived experience must be involved in the count and they must be compensated. There, in the past, there have also been entire sections of the city that were not represented and we need to make sure they're represented in the future. Youth must be involved in every aspect of the count. They're in the best position to know how to find their peers. They should be in multiple fo focus groups. They should be encouraged to participate in the count themselves and it's essential that they be compensated. There should also be a PSA campaign that youth advise with. And as mentioned previously, it is so important that we collaborate more with the, the DOE. We mentioned some collaboration, but I mean, there needs to be more because many young people will have contact with the public school system before they reach out to the RHY system. I thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. 
Um, it looks like Anthony has joined us. Anthony George, you can you may now begin your testimony. Starting time. All right, good afternoon. I've heard all um that Randy said. I was curious about knowing I I heard. I heard him talking about um, the mental health at the drop-in centers, right? With licensed um, mental health counselors or LMSWs. I was curious to find out or if there's any plan to include a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner in the future to help out in this capacity. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, we will now hear from our second panelists, second group of um, panelists. Wait, uh, I would like to ask uh, a few questions of, of the panel. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, uh, I hope uh, Jamie is still on also. Um, uh, you know, uh, Jamie, I, I was interested in, in hearing um, <laughs> you finish your statement, uh, but I also wanted to ask, you know, what homeless youth engagement approaches um, would you rec uh, recommend given that this population's tendency is to kind of stay hidden for survival, you know, as a survival strategy? Well, I think one, we also need to acknowledge that the numbers that we're looking to increase are primarily for unsheltered homeless youth. Right. And so the fact that DYCD relies primarily on resourcing and outreaching and doing surveys in the actual shelter and drop-in centers is not necessarily the most effective method. And unfortunately, there's only one agency that does use specific street outreach. Um, so obviously that's a huge task for an entire city. And so I think that one of the top things that really needs to happen is an intentional increase of street outreach period all the time, all year, to engage young people in this, but specifically for the youth count, right? To be reaching the young people that aren't already connected to the runaway and homeless youth services um, so that one, they can be counted, but two, so that we can let them know what's available. One of the stats that came out of the 2020 report that I thought was alarming um, and is something where I think we need to dive a little deeper is that out of the number of young people that were found unsheltered during the 2020 youth count, 32% of them had reported that they had been without a permanent place to stay for more than two years. So that means that two whole years, right, where opportunities were missed for someone to engage that young person and bring them into services. Thank you. Jane, did you uh, want to weigh in on, you know, um, any of um, approaches that we could use that you would recommend to try to, you know, uh, access or, or provide access to those um, young people who, you know, are, are hidden, who are yeah. not, yeah. I think we need young people to lead the way on that, right? Because a lot of our, of those young youth avoid service professionals, right? So we need young people to let us know where they think their peers are. And I think they're often in fast food restaurants, right? They're often in hospitals, they're often in libraries. And those are places that we're not looking for in the count. So I think we need more, like more of a street outreach component where we're actually, you know, I, I, Covenant House doesn't have this anymore because we lost funding for it, but you, we used to have outreach vans and our outreach drivers knew where young people were living, right? They knew where in the parks, they knew what abandoned buildings they were in. So people like that need to be brought in, uh, in in advance with focus groups of where to look, because I don't believe any of those people like staying in fast food restaurants or hospitals or libraries are being counted. And then also more of a more of a PSA. I mean, DYCD mentioned that they're doing outreach, which they are, but I don't think that outreach, and I could be wrong, but my understanding is not specifically for the count. So a lot, in a lot of their numbers, they gave their budget numbers and their staffing numbers, which are all great, but not it's not dedicated specifically to the count. So there's you know 14 people working on the count, but I, I don't, uh, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's like, anyone who that's their main job responsibility. Okay, thank you. And, um, and you also mentioned compensation 
for for the youth working what do you think would be adequate comp compensation Okay, sorry, I wasn't unmuted. I, I think, you know, I think we can discuss the dollar amount in general, though. We at Covenant House, we always comp compensate our youth leaders. Um, sometimes it's $25 an hour, sometimes it's, um, you know, minimum wage, but we, we make sure that every single hour they spent is compensated because their, their services are as valuable as, as staff. And I honestly think in this situation, they're more so. So I actually have youth interns that we pay um, $250 every other week for helping me run an advocacy program. But I, I think there should be some, some leaders who are paid like that type of almost a salary thing. And then other youth who are encouraged to participate on the night of the count could be paid on more of an hourly wage. Um, and of the three of you, um, Jane, Jamie, and Anthony, um, are are any of you active participants in the planning uh, meetings uh, for the youth count? The Coalition for Homeless Youth is not an active participant in the youth count. Since we've taken over the support contract for the New York City Youth Action Board, we've attended meetings um, in our support role uh, with the group of young people that have been directly impacted by homelessness, but the Coalition for Homeless Youth as an individual entity does not participate in the count. Um, Mr. George? George? Yes, uh, one of my program directors usually participates, but she's on maternity leave right now. <laughs> I'm gonna have to be the one <laughs> that steps in. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to see you're giving her maternity leave. <laughs> um, uh, Ms. Biggleson, are you? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to be honest, you know, it's important to just be completely honest. I believe we are invited to planning meetings, but on the other hand, we are also so stretched, so thin, particularly in COVID. So a lot of this falls on our intake workers and our case managers and uh, the, the upticks in, in, in caseloads. And, and what we're doing is, it's again, it's people with multiple responsibilities, right? Wow. There wow. needs to be people where this can be a primary responsibility for. So yes, we'll invite, you know, people are invited to a meeting, but it's one of a hundred other things that they have to do. Right. Um, and um, and I, I, I didn't ask that question to call any of you out. Um, I actually wanted to, to know if you had been a, a part of um, the planning and if you felt that, you know, um, your voices, um, your suggestions and uh, recommendations were you know were being listened to and uh, and that efforts were being made to try to accommodate what you know you're you are the point people you're the hands-on um, folks and um, so I was just trying to see you know um, if there's something we need to do to improve you know the communication you know the 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 fact that when we give input that, you know, it's actually being uh, taken into consideration and we see, you know, some movement toward um, up improving or, or changing the methodology. Um, so uh, I, I wasn't trying to call you out. I, I'm just really trying to find out how, um, because I'm, I'm, I'm a process oriented person and, and I'm looking for solutions. And um, I've heard these um, recommendations a number of times now at, at this hearing <clears throat> regarding the youth count. And I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how do we move from them being recurring topics, uh, themes or suggestions to where you know, it becomes implemented and sort of where you know, uh, I'm trying to figure out how we make that happen. You know, and um, I'm really glad to see the administration still on the line, you know, so yeah, I know Mr. Miller is, you know, is, is listening to this so that, you know, we can um, try to, to make it where the efficacy is what's important and that, you know, we, uh, we get an accurate count. So I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for all your efforts and um, 
you're doing a really difficult job, um, you know, with, with not enough resources and, you know, and I thank you. And I, I, I had hoped that during my tenure, I could change that. I, I had hoped that we could make sure that all of our youth programs are, are appropriately resourced uh, so that we, we would be really serving our youth well um, in the city. I think, you know, as you know, I think they should be a priority every year. It's not just one specific budget year or one specific budget um, program, uh, I, I, I think, I know we have to make them the priority. And so um, I hope before I leave, I, I can, you know, have some impact on, on how we change the efficacy of the youth count. So thank you for your remarks. And, and that goes for any of the other panelists who are working really diligently and hard, you know, with that populate, with our, pop, our youth population. So with that, um, my council, uh, you can call the next panel. Thank you, Chair. Um, oh, oh, oh and, and maybe some of my colleagues might have questions for the yeah. panel. I'm sorry. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I would like to remind council members who have questions for particular panelists to use the raise hand function in Zoom. It does not appear as, the, as if we have any additional questions. So we will now, the next panelist will be in the follow up. Oh, Council Member Chin, you have yeah. a question? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Chair, Starting I just, time. I want to uh, thank this panel and, and the advocacy. And I just, you know, listening to, to your suggestion and also from the administration, and I do agree with you that that's got to be, you know, special personnel and budget designated for this. And it shouldn't be just focused on that few days, that one day, or so now they increase it to three days. It's, it really should be all year round. And the, the outreach effort, you know, all these programs that DYCD have, they could easily do the survey. It's reaching the youth that are invisible, you know, and I think that really getting uh, the homeless youth um, who have experienced uh, this to participate, to be the one leading this effort because we know they're out there and we just have to bring them in. And all the advocacy that we have done, I think in our 10 year council member roles, right? And also with um, our former, you know, council member Lou Fiddler, you know, that we have increased, right, you know, right. beds for homeless and runaway youth. And that was, you know, his top priority. And we managed to, you know, continue to do that. But we know there's still a lot of them out there. So we really need to continue to advocate to make sure that that there are resources available um, so that we can reach this vulnerable population. I mean, they really deserve, you know, much more support from our city. And I really want to thank you uh, for all the great work um, that you have been doing. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, the next panelists will be in the following order. Rose Yasonia from SEO Family Services, Maddox Gorilla, Youth Action Board Director, and Ramon LeClerc. Rose Yasonia, you may now begin your testimony. Starting time. It looks like Rose is no longer available. And we will then turn to Maddox Gorilla. You may now begin your testimony. Starting time. Um, everyone, I first want to, I'm just, I'm disappointed that, um, DYCD has left because they're not going to hear this. Um, I don't know, maybe in the future, not having to go first so they can actually hear feedback from people. And I also want to clarify some of the statements that we made that are just not true. People are not adequately compensated from staff to young people. Like he mentioned, staff are given discretionary, um, money. They get to decide what that so most times staff to use it to fund other positions, you know, give workers like the employees more time while people, young people who are there to the youth count are doing the count on their own. Um, also the engagement do I see how with the yeah, it's not engagement, it's totally surprising. They do not, you know what I like feedback that we gave twenty seventeen was just implemented in twenty twenty. So they literally tell us three years delayed. 
obviously this has led to people not wanting to invest their time there anymore. And I want to clarify that just because we happen to work together, that does not mean collaboration. Just because I am in a meeting with, let's say, Council Member Chen, we don't talk, we don't email interchangeably, we don't have a relationship, then I can't say we are collaborators. And that is what we're doing. Just because we have been in the same room together by another agency, I just want to clarify that that is a collaboration. And I will go on to testify the letter um, because I am representing the YAP, and my name is Maddox Gorilla. As the coordinator of the YAP, I will continue to reiterate some of the points that we did already testify in our April hearing. Um, we limited our involvement in the 2021 count due to not agreeing with the way the count was being handled by DYCD, specifically the way they were collaborating with youth. Our recommendations from still staff have not been addressed by DYCD. They are as follows. Now is being run by a single staff. You know, y'all, we already went over this today. Right? It's really just Tracy, though. They named 14 people. Um, DYCD isn't, approach isn't working with the experience of homelessness, tokenizing, and analysis. DYCD needs to engage in professional development to understand what it means to work with people with lived experience in a leadership capacity. Second, DYCD needs to work collaboratively with the YAP to make sure that there is a clear understanding of the YAP's role in account what power we have, how DYCD will implement equitable planning and decision process. As we see this year, DYCD has not started planning for the count. The plan is four months away. I haven't been invited to meetings. Providers have not been invited to planning meeting yet. So they failed to implement this a year long effort. As somebody mentioned earlier, we not, DYCD is the youth count like just another thing. And they put way more effort into their town halls, things that they do for their community. So what message are they putting out when they are that are presenting? Time expired. This youth in New York, and they are the ones not showing up for them, and they show more for youth in the um, education system. Uh, so, yeah, I just want to say that that's what I want to say. I'm not, every time I, have, I come on here, it's baffling. It's, it's honestly disgusting because they're, all they do is lie. And it's not reflective of what's going on on the ground. And we're here because we do want to make a change. And also, if people are not honest, we can't make change. Part of growth is being honest. And unfortunately, that's not what, what occurs. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Raymond Leclerc to test Ramon Leclerc, pardon, to testify. Starting time. Good afternoon, council members. Um, I am extremely perplexed and appalled by Mr. Scott's testimony of seven street homeless youth at the time of the youth count. And new alternatives we see between, between 10 and 20 street homeless youth on a weekly basis, every week of the year. I would also like to bring um, some other issues to the council's attention with people who are living in DYCD shelters. Um, their, their discharge policy and um, we receive complaints of unsafe environments. Their discharge policy, there are clients who are participating in survival sex you know, who are trying to make money to survive or being discharged for missing curfew, which I feel if a client is trying to survive by any means necessary, but their needs are not being met in the shelter, excuse me, and they have to participate in survival sex, they're basically being discharged for curfew violations. And also we still hear of allegations of verbal and physical abuse within the DYCD system. And um, I was also really appalled that Mr. Scott found questioning amusing at points during his set the questioning of his testimony. <sighs> I'm sorry, I don't want to rile myself up too much. I think I've made my points. I relinquish that's my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, for your testimony. Chair, if you have any questions, feel free. 
um, you know, I'm, I'm really taken aback by um, uh, the, I, I guess the, the pain that I'm seeing and hearing that, um, that DYCD is not meeting the needs of our, of our young people. Um, I am going to uh, definitely address with them your concerns. And um, uh, I, I, I will be able, I hope to be able to get back to you with some kind of uh, responses to, to the concerns that you have brought forward. Um, I also, um, I would like to ask you to attend the meeting, um, the planning meeting, so that, you know, we can really get to, you know, to the next steps where we are really serving um, our unsheltered young people, our, our invisible young people, our young people who are out there just trying to survive. Um, that's the goal. And I would be happy to, I, I would, ha I would, I'm sorry, I would be happy to be invited and participate. Okay. All right. I'm going to work on that. I'm going to work on that. Um, I know that you've given your, um, your information to, uh, you know, to sign in to be a participant. Uh, so I'm asking uh, my legislative staff to, to make a note that uh, I, I'd like to um, invite uh, Mr. LeClerc and Mr. Gorilla to, um, to a meeting where we can discuss the issues that they brought up. Um, and with that, I, uh, again, I, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for your interest and, and for your efforts that you're making uh, for our RHY population and our unsheltered young people. Um, I have no other questions. Does council member Chin, would you like to ask any questions? Yeah, um, Chair Rose, I just think that, you know, maybe after this hearing, mm -hmm. that it might be good to really set up a meeting with DYCD yeah. and with some of the advocates who testified today to really mm -hmm. go over some of those uh, issues. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I think that is unfortunate they mm -hmm. they left and they didn't hear all this because if they're not telling us, giving us the accurate information, which they sworn to it, yeah, yeah. we gotta challenge them. Yeah, them. absolutely. So, um, and that's what I was alluding to, Council Member Chen. We're on the same page that um, we definitely have to have a meeting um, because. Uh, uh, I, I don't like to hear the, the discrepancies and the, and the contradictions of, yeah. of, of the testimony. So um, we will. Yeah, do we that. should we should do it before you and I. Are oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> before we we ride off. And into we've been the on sunset. this committee. This is our twelfth yes. year. We got it. We got to make yeah. sure that we we set some good foundation before we before we move on. So. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> So, so um, you can count on me when you set up the meeting. Yeah. Be there. Thank you, and <laughs> thank um, you, and and for the advocates uh, um, and those um, who have participated, who testified today, we will be getting in touch with you, um, and we'll set up that meeting. Um, with that, I'm I'm finished. I have no other questions. Um, Thank you, Chair. At this point, we have concluded public testimony. However, if we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in the order in which your hand was raised. I'm going to give everyone a moment to see if anyone would like to raise their hand. All right, we are confirming that we do not have any additional registrants. Um, so, Chair Rose, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Okay, I have, I've lost my video, but I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you yes, hear me? Yes, and we can still see you. 
Oh, oh, and you can? Oh, I just can't see you. Okay, well, um, with that, um, I think I've made uh, my closing remarks that um, uh, I'm really, uh, I, I wanna thank everyone who testified today. We are going to have a follow-up meeting and, um, and again, thank you for all of your efforts on behalf of New York City Youth. And with that, this meeting is adjourned and it is 12.50. Thank you for...